We're close to what I think we had registered. So I think we can go ahead and get started if that sounds good. And I'll just keep letting folks in um, since it's a little bit after seven. Okie doke. Well, that sounds great to me. I'm John Lawrence and I am the uh, executive director of Sycamore Land Trust. And already I jumped ahead one slide on the Zoom presentation. So yeah, well, we're off, to, we're off to start. Hey, thanks everyone for being here this evening. Uh, this is our first con conservation conversation and we are starting it off uh, this series with Doug Tallamy, the author of Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard. After a brief introduction about Sycamore, I will be uh, turning it over to Doug. And as I said, this is uh, the first in our conservation conversation series of lectures from authors and local experts who inspire us to get involved in conservation. Recordings of our conservation conversation series lectures will be available on our website at sycamorelandtrust.org forward slash conversation. And our next conversation will be coming up on March 10th is Damn It, How Beavers Can Save the Planet with Ben Goldfarb, who is the author of Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. As you can see, they do a lot of, they're quite eager to do work at our Bean Blossom Bahamas Nature Preserve. Now, Sycamore Land Trust is a nonprofit conservation organization that was founded here in Monroe County in 1990 to preserve the beauty, health, and diversity of Southern Indiana's natural landscape through strate strategic land conservation, habitat restoration, and environmental education. We protect so far 121 properties, totaling 10,319 acres, with more on the way. We own and manage nature preserves and also hold conservation easements to protect private properties. We maintain over 30 miles of public hiking trails on 13 of our nature preserves, uh, all in Southern Indiana. Our environmental education program connects thousands of people to all ages to nature through guided hikes and free outdoor nature programming for local schools and community organizations. And most importantly, this work is powered by over 1,200 members and hundreds of dedicated volunteers. One of our most popular public trails is at our Bean Blossom Bottoms Nature Preserve, a very important part of the Bean Blossom Creek Bicentennial Conservation Area in Northern Monroe County. This wetland property was dedicated as an Indiana State Nature Preserve by the Indiana Department of Natural Resources and has also been designated a state important bird area by the National Audubon Society and a wetland of distinction by the Society of Wetland Scientists. The boardwalk at Bean Blossom Bottoms, which you can see here, is one of the longest in the Midwest, and our staff and volunteers work many hours every year to keep it prepared and maintained. Our projects to manage and restore natural habitat range from pollinator plantings at several of our nature preserves, including an acre that we planted just this past month at Tangeman Woods in Bartholomew County, to bigger projects like planting tens of thousands of trees as we did a few years ago at our Touch the Earth 2 Preserve in Brown County. Our land stewardship projects create room for native plant growth and for the restoration of wildlife habitat. There's one of our favorites, the American woodcock. And each year our Volunteers help us in annual efforts to reverse the spread of native plants, including garlic mustard, you can see here on, on the left, uh, and other harmful invasive species, which threaten native biodiversity. We also sustainably collect native seeds to grow for restoration projects and more. And through these habitat restoration projects, Sycamore Land Trust is helping to preserve and restore Southern Indiana's incredible biodiversity for future generations. 
course, if you have any questions, please get in touch with us. And tonight, Mary Wells, our education director, will be monitoring the chat during Doug's presentation and the question and answer session that will follow. Uh, you can type your questions in the chat window and we'll do our best to include them. And also some of you have already emailed your questions ahead of time, so thank you very much. With that, I will stop sharing my screen. If it'll let me do that and ask Mary to uh, say hello to everyone, give a, give a quick wave. There you go. Hi, everybody. I'm the one that will be uh, fielding your questions. So feel free um, as they come up, um, put them in the chat, but then we'll wait till the end to go through some of those with, with Doug and our group. All right. And without further ado, I would like to welcome Doug Tallamy. Doug is the T.A. Baker Professor of Agriculture in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has authored 104 research publications and has taught insect-related courses for 40 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His book, Nature's Best Hope, a New York Times bestseller, was released in February 2020, and his latest book, The Nature of Oaks, was released by Timber Press in March 2021. So, Doug, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us, and I will turn it over to you. All right. Thanks a lot, John. Hearing your introduction makes me realize we're actually pushing 41 years now. Time doesn't stop. Okay, thanks for coming, everybody. I want to talk about uh, my idea of what nature's best hope is. But before I do that, I want to talk about E.O. Wilson's book. He wrote in uh, 2016, I guess, called Half Earth. Of course, many of you realize that uh, Edward O. Wilson died the day after Christmas. Um, the day before that, uh, Tom Lovejoy died. This has been a rough start, 2022, for conservation. We've lost some, some giants. But... Um, Ed Wilson worked his entire career uh, on many different things, but a constant theme was saving the life on planet Earth. And this book was really the culmination of all the things he's thought about. He said, in order to, to, to save life anywhere on the planet, we're going to have to save functioning natural systems on at least half of the Earth. Uh, and he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. And then he pretty much ended the book. He didn't spend a lot of time talking about how we could save nature on half of the earth. Of course, to conservation biologists, that's, that's a wonderful idea. Great, let's put half the earth aside uh, and, and all will be great. But half of planet earth, the terrestrial earth anyway, is already in some form of agriculture. And we've got almost 8 billion people in the other half, along with our airports and our roads and our detritus. And we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So how can this be possible? Well, that's actually what I wanna talk about tonight. I think we can realize EO's dream, but we're gonna need a new approach to conservation to do it. Before we talk about that though, let's talk about what happened uh, in 2019. Uh, at least uh, in the East Coast, we had uh, what we, we call an oak mast. Members of the red oak group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained, so I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. And I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a, a hole for its head, and it forced its head through there, and it forced its entire body through that little hole. It was a tight squeeze. Looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally, it plopped down and very dangerous time for this insect larvae because a lot of things want to eat it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface. It takes about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber converts itself to a pupa. And then it stays there for two years. After two years, it comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what a weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule. And the mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. They take those mouth parts, chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in that hole, and that's how the larva gets down there. 
Well, you might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the very next year like most insects would do? Uh, and the reason is it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for those acorn weevils. Of course, after they leave the acorn, it leaves a hole in the acorn, a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils in acorns. And if scouts find a new acorn with a new hole, they get all excited because their old acorn is falling apart. So they tell everybody it is time to move. They grab the larvae and they grab the eggs. They move the entire colony into the new acorn in about 30 minutes. Then they post a guard here, make sure nobody else comes in. And that's where they'll live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. So what's my point with all this? That's just one, literally one of millions of very specialized interactions between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and oaks. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They will, they will take an acorn and fly up to a mile from the parent tree. Then they'll tap that acorn beneath the soil surface. Uh, and the object is they're gonna go back in, in the winter time and retrieve that acorn and have something to eat. But for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So for every four acorns they bury, they have planted three new oak trees. Specialized relationship between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That's what they feed their young, carpenter ants. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have a lot of carpenter ants. And you won't have a lot of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have that plant, facilia. That is the only pollen that that bee can rear its young on. And it turns out pollen specialization is very common in, in our native bees. We've got about 4,000 species of native bees, but over a third of them can only reproduce in the pollen of particular plants. You won't have the Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle head. I could talk all night, all week, all year about nature's specialized relationships. But the point I wanna to make tonight is that these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the, the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't leave most of the country as it was. Uh, there's only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original uh, pristine ecological condition. And that's, of course, because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We've grazed it. It's 770 million acres of rangeland. That's four and a half times the size of Texas, all dedicated to cows. And of course, we, we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We've polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other, other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature we need them to sustain that runs the ecosystems that we all depend on. And you might wonder why we've done this. I wonder why we've done this. And I don't know, but I bet we thought the earth, our nest was so large, we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. Of course, we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines these days, like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? I'm talking about global insect decline, followed by this one. North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's almost a third of our North American bird population already gone. The UN says we're gonna lose a million species to extinction, probably in the next 20 years. I don't know if you remember, maybe two months ago, we removed 23 species from the endangered species list. Not because we've saved them, but because they're already extinct. So this is happening, but you know what? We can't allow it to happen. There is no way we humans are gonna remain happy if we allow the nature that supports us to disappear on planet Earth. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment and this upon all of our houses. But that's not what this, this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people like you, like me. Those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. 
What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Well, E.O. Wilson told us what it would mean if we were to lose insects, and he did it way back in 1987 with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And his message was clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And then most of our flowering plants disappear. That would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial uh, ecosystems that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, even many of our freshwater fishes, those food webs would collapse and those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would, would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that right now rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is some good news here and that is that none of that has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're gonna have to change the way we landscape to do it and we're gonna have to change the way we landscape pretty soon. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on the life support that nature provides us. We call them ecosystem services. Here are a few things that, that plants do that we depend on, like the production of oxygen, pretty important. Clean water, they clean our water and slow its journey to the sea where it becomes too, too salty to use. Carbon capture, enormously important today, pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, building their tissues out of that carbon and then pumping the extra carbon into the ground build topsoil, hold it in place, prevent floods, plants dampen severe weather, they convert sunlight into food. You know, if we lost our plants, we'd have to eat sunlight and that would be very difficult. What do animals do for plants? They provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroys the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's, it's a terrible idea. Because of all this, people, we got, we got almost 8 billion people on the planet. So we require more ecosystem services today than ever before. Of course, we want to use these services for us, but we don't want to wipe out everything else by taking what those, those uh, animals need as well. Now, there have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth. And Aldo Leopold was, was uh, one of the most eloquent. He wrote uh, extensively in the first half of the 1900s. <clears throat> and one of the things he said is the only task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. There have been indigenous groups that have been good at doing that for long periods, but our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, then going to another area doing the same thing. Not sustainable behavior. But Adel Leopold had a lot of faith in humans. He believed we could develop what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the earth. We had to farm and lumber and graze and do all of those things, but he believed we could learn to do them gently enough so that we did not destroy local ecosystems. That's what he called a land ethic, and he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he did not write about, though, was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time, that notion was so deeply embedded in, in Aldo Leopold's day, still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have seen it as an option. What I want to argue this evening, though, is that not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We need to turn that on its head. We now need to, to save nature, actually reconstruct it where we've dismantled it, where there are a lot of people, because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes not hang on by a thread, not get diminished every year, but thrive. Where should we start? Let's go back to private property. Most of the land is privately owned. There's only 12% of the U.S. that's permanently protected. 85.6% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. It's either 95 or 98% of Texas is privately owned. If we don't do conservation on private property, we're gonna fail. We do have parks. We do have preserves, but they are too small, too isolated, and too few to sustain the amount of nature that we need. So now we have to do conservation outside of those parks and preserves 
on private property. Now, when I talk about conservation, I'm really not using the word correctly. Yes, we wanna conserve all of those natural areas that remain, absolutely. But in most places, there are not many that remain. So what we're talking about now is, is a form of restoration. We wanna put it back together again, and we wanna put it back together again where we humans are. And we know it's not gonna look exactly like it did before, but we can reunite enough of those specialized interactions so that we have functional ecosystems once again. But not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we have to start with the building blocks and then add the other species later on. And there are two groups that we can't do without. The flowering plants that are capturing energy from the sun and turning it into food, storing it in their plant parts. And of course we need the pollinators that allow those, those uh, flowering plants to reproduce. That's one group. Now we've got the energy from the sun, the food in plant parts, mostly plant leaves. We have to get it to animals or we don't have any animals. And most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat invertebrates that eat plants. So things like insects. And it turns out that not just any insect, it's caterpillars that are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, we've got failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. I'm gonna use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Uh, I believe you have the black cap chickadee uh, in Indiana. You might have the Carolina down in Southern Indiana. Almost the same bird. They're the birds at our feeder right now eating seeds and people think that's all they need is seeds. Well, 50% of their diet in the wintertime is seeds, but the other 50% is insects and spiders. But when they're reproducing, their babies can't eat seeds. So they got to switch entirely to insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young almost exclusively on caterpillars. And they are not exception. 96% of our terrestrial birds are rearing their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? Well, there's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that. But this is a citizen science project that one of my grad students did recently. Ashley Kennedy uh, put out a call for um, bird photographers across the country to take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they were carrying food to the nest. And the object was to, to identify the prey items in the beaks of these birds and reconstruct the nestling diet for as many species of birds uh, as, as possible. So she got thousands of pictures, did a lot of identifying. And this is a summary of her results for the 20 most common bird families that she had enough data for. The green bars are the percentage of those nestling diets that were caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families in North America, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, imagine what would happen if we built landscapes that don't have enough caterpillars. Most of our birds would not be able to reproduce. So there's something special about caterpillars. What is it? There's actually several things special about caterpillars. And one of them is that they're soft. Think of these guys as if, if uh, they're little sausages with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is, is its exoskeleton, its cuticle. It's, it's made of chitin, which is undigestible. So the birds don't want a lot of that. And because caterpillars are soft, you can stuff them down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring them. If you've ever watched a parent bird rear its young, they're pretty rough. The beak is like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. And many of our birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? Uh, they're nutritious. They're, they're high in fat, high in protein, low percentage of chitin of exoskeleton compared to many other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like, like little sausages, they're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible. And a lot of beetles have very sharp edges too. And finally, it turns out that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now I mentioned carotenoids, not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm, I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates, and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids, so we have to get our carotenoids from plants, and we have to get them from plants because uh, carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. But well, where are the birds getting their carotenoids from? from? From what they eat, of course, but when they're reproducing, remember, they're not eating any plant parts, and carotenoid content is not equally distributed among bird prey items. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars, far more carotenoids uh, in caterpillars than anything else. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies themselves. They have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm over here. 
So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and several others are suggesting that caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. They're essential parts of bird diets. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. Uh, the next question is how many? How many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two enough or one or two a day enough? Well, let's go back to chickadees. There's a lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one nest of chickadees to the point where they, they uh, fledge, where they leave the nest, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. So you're, you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadees to the point of independence when they keep eating caterpillars. And if you want chickadees to, to uh, breed in your yard, and I would think you, you do, because in so many places, that's all we have, you have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because chickadees uh, forage about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to, to one of the preserves that, that you people have, have so thoughtfully preserved. And if we landscape in a way that, that where we don't have all of those insects available for our chickadees and all the other birds, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like that's directly related or one of the important causes of the bird declines that we're seeing these days. We went to the uh, original data set from Rosenberg et al. That's the Smithsonian group that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial birds into two groups. The species that require insects at some part of their life history, typically when they're breeding, and the species that don't. Things like doves and finches that can actually reproduce on seeds. They make a little milk out of it and they can feed that to their babies. Well, the, the birds that don't require insects did not decline at all in the last 50 years. But the birds that do require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. This doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that as you take away bird food, you lose the birds. So we need to expand our, our goals when we're landscaping. In the past, we had one goal. We're going to make pretty landscapes. Okay, that's a fine goal. But now we need pretty landscapes that are also ecologically functional. And they're not going to be ecologically functional unless they have a lot of caterpillars in them. So how do we add caterpillars to our, our landscapes? Well, we do that by adding the plants that support those caterpillars, which seems pretty simple. But there is a catch, and that is most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about it. We have to be fussy about which, which plants we choose. And we be, have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy about it. And the monarch butterfly illustrates that perfectly. You can have all the calorie pear and all the hostas and all the burning bushes and all the camellias and all the things that we typically landscape with in your yard and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. You all know that we need milkweeds. That's called host plant specialization. Uh, and it turns out that most of the insects that, that uh, eat plants are host plant specialists. Why is that? By host plant specialists, they can only eat particular plants. Well, most plants, most insects are host plant specialists because plants have made them that way. Plants don't wanna be eaten. They wanna capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects uh, out there that wanna eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those, those chemical defenses? Well, this is where specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists, just like the monarch. And what that means is in every plant lineage that's out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And an insect species can't adapt to all of them. That's, that's too big an evolutionary ask. So what they do is they pick one or two plant lineages that are really similar in how they protect themselves and they get good at getting around those defenses. They develop particular enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize their exposure to those nasty compounds. It does take a long period of history with the uh, plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And when they do, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant. 
So if you do take the milkweeds out of your yard and replace them with, with hostas or calorie pear or anything else, the monarch butterfly is not going to start to eat your hostas or your calorie pear. It's going to disappear. It locked in to eating milkweeds. And that's why when we bring in plants from other continents, uh, we, we wreck our local food webs because most of our insects cannot eat those plants. And if those plants become invasive species, like calorie pears, like burning bush, like barberry, like autumn olive, and on and on and on, and they penetrate our natural areas, they're destroying the food webs in our natural areas as well because our insects can't eat them. So all I'm saying here is that plant choice matters. If we're going to rebuild functional food webs, if we're going to rebuild local ecosystems, we have to choose the plants that allow us to do that or it's not going to work. And I'm going to give you, give you three examples of how well it does work when we do choose the right plants. And I'm going to start with, with uh, my house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. I should say Cindy's in my house, my wife, Cindy. This is uh, where we, we moved in the year 2000. Uh, a farm had been broken up uh, into 10 acre lots. We got one of them. It had been mowed for hay before we moved in. So this is what it looked like. There, there are very few plants there, um, almost no woody plants. So our goal was to restore this, this little patch of the Eastern deciduous uh, ecosystem. And you can't do that without bringing the caterpillars back. So here's, here's some of the things that, that we did uh, that, that uh, made that work. I wanted to see if I could attract the Canadian owlet to our yard. That's what a Canadian owlet looks like. It's a pretty little thing. That's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. Well, you don't have Canadian owlets unless you have meadow root. They are host plant specialists on meadow root. It's the only thing they're going to eat. And we didn't have any meadow root. There's no meadow root anywhere around us. This place was farmed to death for 300 years. Uh, so I got some meadow root seeds from someplace, planted them. They grew very nicely, but um, this was early on. And I actually had very little faith that uh, Canadian owlets would be able to find my tiny patch of meadow root. So I didn't go out and check them regularly. It must have been two months after I planted them before I walked by for the first time. And they were covered with Canadian owlets. The, the caterpillars, the, the moth had found it right away. I'm still surprised about that. Uh, so now we have a good population of metaru and Canadian owlets. We've added two species to the property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. That's actually a misnomer. This beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's Aristosa ditch daisy. Uh, I did know where there was some ditch daisy in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I went and got some seeds, planted them. They grew very nicely. Um, well, it took a year for the goldenrod stowaway to find my ditch daisy, but they finally did. And now I've got a good population of both of them. Now we've added four species to the property. One in the Hackberry hemp Emperor. Not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it belongs here. It's one of the species that ought to be here. One of the species that used to be here. And as its name suggests, it's a specialist on hackberry, on celtis, and we didn't have any hackberry. So I planted it. Uh, and well, it took four years for the butterflies to find my hackberry, but they finally did. I looked at one of my hackberry branches in June. There were nine hackberry emperor caterpillars on a single branch. Another big success. So now we've added six species to the property. And that's how it went. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own, and along with it came many of the things that require goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the Arcidra flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is one that hasn't come, the goldenrod flower moth. I don't know why it hasn't come. This is what a caterpillar looks like. Um, it's had plenty of chances, but it's not here. But this is part of, of the fun. This is anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year, I look for the goldenrod flower moth. One of these years, I'm going to find it, and that'll be a great year. Plant a Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. I know a lot of people don't like Virginia creeper. I just don't know why they don't like Virginia creeper. It's a great native plant. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. It's got good fall color. It's a good ground cover. It makes uh, very nutritious berries for the birds in the fall, very high in fat. As a matter of fact, it's a great pollinator plant. Even though its, its flowers are tiny and, and uh, inconspicuous and not beautiful at all. The reason you know Virginia creeper is in bloom because there's clouds of, of native bees around those, those flowers. Remember, when you're making a pollinator garden, you're making it for the pollinators. If it's not big and showy for you, that's okay. Well, the reason I planted uh, Virginia creeper is because uh, it's the primary host plant for the big sphinx moths that are an important component of cardinal diets. So things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. 
I want to see if I get the double tooth prominent at our house, just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. I mean, even if you don't like caterpillars, you got to like this guy. Well, it's a specialist on elm, particularly American elm. And of course, we lost our American elms to, to Dutch elm disease a long time ago. There are two uh, big American elms at the University of Delaware that did not die. And every year they make a lot of seed. I got those seeds, planted them at home. Uh, they grew really nicely. Those trees are 80 feet tall now. And they did bring in the double tooth prominent, a big success. American elm. Wanted the evening primrose moth because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Believe it or not, we didn't have any evening primrose, any, any enothera. So I planted it. The moth came, spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. It's very cute. And I planted a lot of oak, tree, oak trees. Now, these are just uh, examples of the plant lineages that, that we put back so far. But I want to focus on oaks for a while because they're such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. Uh, it's, it's huge. People argue about whether it's, it's 400 years old or 500 years old. You know, and I hear people say, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if it has to be 400 years old before you can enjoy your oak, you're right, you're not gonna. But if you can enjoy what your oak does for your landscape, what it does ecologically, what it contributes, you can enjoy it right away. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or as two foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to rebuild that caterpillar based food web, the moth based food web that supports so many other things at our house. By bringing in things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, Suzuki's promolactus, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser rogue dagger moth, the greater rogue dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown ducalatrix, the white no, the orange patch smoky wing, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species of moss have come to the, the oaks on my yard. And they come right away. This is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the leaves. And here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that plant. So you don't have to wait decades or hundreds of years for your oaks to start to support the local food web. They will do it immediately. This is what our house looks like today, standing in the same place I took that first picture. Um, of course, well, this is what it looks like in the summertime. Got a little lawn there, we're very traditional, but we put a lot of plants back. And of course, right away, I noticed that as you put the plants back, the life comes back with it. Uh, and since we moved in, I have learned that caterpillars are the, the uh, they're a great index for how complex your food web is, how successful your restoration is. All you have to do is count the number of caterpillar species you, you have. So I started doing that four years ago. I've been taking pictures of every moth species that I have at, at my house. I haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. And I'm a, a one to, up to 1,140 species of moths so far, not finished yet. And we have 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So I'd one 240 thousandth of the landmass, we have 44% of all the moths that occur in the entire state. And because so many of these are types of bird food, we have recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline that we see uh, now and then. The World Wildlife Fund says that Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. Pretty depressing, but I'm thinking, gee, not at our house. I'm sure we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds uh, and it didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. All we did was put the right plants back. It's something we all can do. So don't, you know, don't get, I mean, these are scary headlines, but don't give up. We can turn this around. But I know what you're thinking. We've got, we got 10 acres and a lot of people don't have 10 acres. Will this work on smaller lots in suburbia? Let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. Um, they have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than, than Cindy and I have. They're in the middle of suburbia, surrounded by everybody with the big lawns. When they moved into their, their yard, it was covered with bush honeysuckle, Amur honeysuckle, another one of our invasives. Uh, so they got rid of that and they planted 75 species of native plants, put in a little water feature for the birds that they call a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to count the... Uh, the birds that are using their yard, they're up to 149 bird species, plus 35 warbler species. If you're a birder, you know that that's a good number. 
Um, just to put that in perspective, we've only recorded eight warbler species at our house so far. So does it work on smaller properties? Absolutely. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean, in Chicago, that, that gray thing back there is one of the towers at, at um, O'Hare Airport. Uh, she's right next to Kennedy Expressway. She's got one tenth of an acre that is completely isolated. It is not next to any natural area at all. It's a beautiful one tenth of an acre, but it's three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. But Pam did the same thing. She got rid of her invasive species, put in 60 species of native plants, little water feature for the birds. And then she sat back and started to count those birds. She's up to 120 bird species that have used her yard, including a woodcock. So I know you've got woodcocks on, on your preserves, but there's Pam's woodcock right there in, in Chicago. Okay, this works, um, but we want it to work really well. There are five keys to, to success uh, that I wanna talk about. One of the things we have to do is shrink the area that we have in lawn in the US. Uh, we've got more than 40 million acres of lawn nationwide, and that's a 2005 statistic, so who knows what it is today. That's an area bigger than uh, all of New England combined, dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Now, I know that, that uh, we need big lawns to advertise our, our status, and I know we need big lawns so we can put out our Halloween decorations, but what if we cut the area of lawn in half? What if we took areas like this and turned them into areas like this? And this is a, a young landscape. Dan Getman sent me this uh, picture a couple of weeks ago. I think he lives in Missouri. Um, so he's converting his big lawn by putting in, in native plantings. Well, uh, if we did that in half the area that's in lawn, that would give us 20 million acres we could put towards conservation. If we do that at home, we could build a new national park at home that I'm calling Homegrown National Park. And it'll be, it'll be huge. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. And up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park be the biggest park in the country. What do we get when we put a park at home or at least some part of nature right where we live? we get the opportunity to interact with, with nature right where we live. All we have to do is, is, is go outside. We can do it at our own time, our own pace, whenever it suits us. We can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, um, there were 375 million people last year that did that. So more often than not, you're with a big crowd. Uh, it's free. There's no admission fee. It's never closed no matter what pandemic comes down the, the pike. No travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone, which I think is essential if you're going to develop that personal relationship with the natural world, not mediated by somebody else. And this is, this is really essential for our kids, our poor kids who are suffering from nature deficit disorder, according to Richard Louvre. Uh, so we're trying, you know, we get 30 kids, we put them on a bus with a teacher and they, they drive for an hour and then they walk around a, a natural place for an hour and teacher tells them not to touch anything. <clears throat> then they get back in the bus and they go home and that's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of nature right where they live, all they have to do is go outside, right in their yard, alone. No parental supervision. They don't need any supervision. Let them explore it in their own way. Develop that personal relationship. It's so important because our kids are the future stewards of the planet. They've got to learn how to steward. They've got to learn to love stewarding. They've got to understand why they're stewarding. And if they don't do those things, they're going to be lousy stewards. We can't afford any more lousy stewardship. And maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very modest patch of nature, a little piece of lawn with a hedge. <clears throat> but there are no lizards there. When she discovered that, she sent me this picture to describe how to hunt lizards. You get on the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards can't see you coming. Then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No smiling. This is serious business. You crawl toward this, you can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you crawl toward the lizard, you, you catch the lizard, you put it in an aquarium, you learn how to take care of it. You develop that personal relationship with that part of nature. You learn to love that part of nature. You learn to care about it. 
Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be crawling on the ground for the rest of her life with her best dress on catching lizards. I don't think. She sent me this picture not long ago, so who knows. But I do think she will remember catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. And I, I do believe that will help her be a good steward when she gets old enough. If you want your kids to do more than catch lizards, get Nancy Stranissi's Nature Play at Home. Dozens of examples of how to expose your kids to the natural world. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, go to our website, homegrownnationalpark.org. It is free. All you're doing is registering where you live uh, and the amount of nature that you're preserving. If you're cutting your lawn in half, how much acreage is that? Um, if you already have a woodlot you're protecting, if you happen to be a land conservancy, you've got all those properties. We want all those properties on, on the map too. We're just trying to find all the people who are doing conservation privately and have those areas light up on the map so we can see connectivity build. We can watch this, this um, public conservation effort go viral. We want to reach people who are not part of the choir already, which is most everybody. And, and this, this form of, of um, social media may help us do that. That's, that's the goal. So please get yourself on the map. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. What plants are we going to put in the areas that uh, used to be lawn? Some of them, I'm going to argue, have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is. This is the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take the stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, I'm calling these keystone plants because if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses. Why is that? Because they're making most of the food. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the, of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that are holding up the, that house. They are essential. You can't build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last hundred years. You're not finished building your house when you have your keystone plants in, but um, they're an essential component of it. So the, the question is no longer simply are, are native plants better than non-native plants. Ecologically, on average, they certainly are. Uh, but there are a lot of native plants that aren't producing all that much either. So the, the real question is, do we want to use the most productive native plants, the hyper-productive native plants that support the most pollinators and the most caterpillars or not? I used to get emails from somebody saying, don't you know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from Asia, used to grow in North America 7 million years ago. That makes them native. That means we can plant them and everything will be great. Yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today, but I'm not going to have that argument because that's not the metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not. It's whether they're doing anything or not. I don't care if ginkgos grew on the moon 7 million years ago. They support zero species of caterpillars here today, and that's what counts. They are here. They are not contributing to our local food web, and that's largely because they are non-native plants. What's contributing more than anything else? It's one of our oaks. In the mid-Atlantic states, oaks support 557 species of caterpillars, over 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. In 84% of the counties in which oaks occur, they're the number one keystone plant. How do you find out what the keystone plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code, and the rank list of both the woody and herbaceous plant genera that are our tops in your county will pop up. So notice I, I say uh, native oaks, native cherries, native willows. If I go to the nursery and say, um, I want to buy a cherry, they're going to try to sell me a, an ornamental cherry from Asia. If I want to buy a willow, they try to sell me a weeping willow from, from Turkey. If I want to buy a birch, it'll probably be a European birch or a, a maple, very likely be a... a uh, um, Japanese maple from Japan, you got to specify that you want a native member of these very powerful genera. Because if you get non-native members, you're going to reduce caterpillar use by 68%. These are the best herbaceous genera. Um, somebody's drawing lines on my, on my PowerPoint here. Zoladego, goldenrods, asters uh, are, are uh, really high. Uh, sunflowers, particularly perennial sunflowers, those are the top three uh, groups of, of genera in terms of not just in terms of supporting caterpillars, but also specialist bees. 
when you're planting a, a pollinator garden, you want to plant for the specialist because the generalist can use those plants as well. If you only plant for the generalist, if you only put in the, the plants that honeybees like, for example, you're going to lose those specialists. So in, on, with, with goldenrods and, and various asters and sunflowers, there are at least 44 species of bees that can only reproduce on those pollens that will be in your yard. But if you don't have those plants, they won't be in your yard. So, okay, we're going to uh, shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. Um, we're going to invite a lot of insects to our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our, our security light. And that, of course, is not the goal. There's a lot of research these days that is, is um, really pointing to light pollution as one of the major causes of insect declines. Uh, these are all the ways that, that uh, our, our lights at night are killing insects, particularly those all-important moths that make those all-important caterpillars. This is good news to me, folks, believe it or not, because we've got to reduce insect declines. Not just, I mean, we've, we've got to stop it and reverse it. So we've got to have insect increases going on. We've already lost 45% of the insects on planet Earth. Remember, they're the little things that, that, that run, run the world. So can't do that. If we can turn insect declines around simply by flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. Uh, but I know what you're going to say. Um, you can't turn the light out over your garage or over your front porch because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on it so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to find out is that the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb out of your, your security light and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED bulb is, is the best uh, because yellow wavelengths are, are um, not nearly as attractive to nocturnal insects as our white wavelengths. So if we reduce or, or, or um, switch out the uh, white bulbs for yellow bulbs in our outdoor lights, overnight we'll, we'll uh, save millions of insects and also millions of dollars because of course LEDs are much more energy efficient. So we're gonna shrink the lawn, we're gonna put in keystone plants, uh, we're gonna turn out our lights, then we're gonna invite Mosquito Joe to come kill all of our, our insects. There's just no shortage of, of the ways we like to kill our insects. This is a booming business all around the country. Um, he's reversing everything that I've been talking about for the last 20 years. But Mosquito Joe says it's okay because this is a natural product. It's pyrethroids. And he's right. It's a natural product. It comes from, from uh, chrysanthemums. But cyanide is a natural product too. So I'm not sure that's a good argument. Uh, he also says it only kills mosquitoes, and boy, I wish he was right about that. But in fact, it kills all the insects it comes in contact with. I don't know if you saw the headlines uh, two falls ago. There were big monarch kills. They flew through Mosquito Joe, hundreds of dead monarchs on the ground. What's really interesting is that it doesn't kill mosquitoes, or it doesn't kill enough mosquitoes. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of them. Mosquito Joe kills between 10 and 50%. So he's not even close to being effective. So he has to keep coming back and spraying and spraying, spraying, making sure he's killing all those non-targets. And he's expensive. If you really want to kill mosquitoes, get a bucket. People say, how big a bucket? I don't care. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in some, some straw or hay, little handful of straw or hay, let it ferment for uh, a couple of days. It's building up populations of uh, algae and diatoms, and that's what mosquito larvae eat. So it becomes an irresistible brew to, to uh, adult mosquitoes. They want to lay their eggs in, in your bucket. Then you put a mosquito dunk in. Go to the harbor store, get a mosquito dunk. It costs uh, about $9. This is Bacillus thuringiensis. You put one in, the mosquito larvae nibble on it, and they die. This is, this is a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. So if you get a dragonfly in here, it's not going to hurt it. If your dog drinks it or, or a bird drinks it, no problem at all. You might put a coarse screen uh, on the top of your bucket so a, a chipmunk doesn't jump in and drown. But um, this is a cheap, targeted way to control mosquitoes. And if everybody had a mosquito dunk bucket in their yard, we'd have far fewer mosquitoes. Okay, the fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, this is an example, but I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, uh, complete their development on the tree. This is the caterpillar, eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon, hangs, hangs from one of the branches, then it emerges as an adult, then it does it all over again. Everything happens on the tree. 
Well, they wish all the moths did that, but most of them, 94% will drop from the tree after the caterpillar finishes growing and wiggle its way beneath the soil surface, if it can, um, and pupate. Or it will spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree, and that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. The way we landscape, we don't tolerate it. And we will make sure there's no leaf litter, make sure there's no beds. We mow and compact all the soil under there so it's rock hard, almost impossible for the caterpillars to get underground. This becomes an ecological trap. We are, we are calling in those uh, moths to lay their eggs, the caterpillars develop, then they drop down and die. And I am convinced this is another major cause of insect declines around the country. And of course, the cement landscape isn't gonna do it either. This is what most people do. They, they have a, a, a tree in a yard. And we're just, this summer, we're gonna start actually measuring how well caterpillars survive in a situation like this, but I guarantee they're gonna survive better in a situation like this, where you have a tree and then a layered landscape. Maybe a dogwood here, a native azalea, fern, ground cover. Um, this is a safe site. This is soft landing for those caterpillars. They can, they can fall down here, easily get underground because it's not compacted. Nobody's gonna, gonna mow them or, or, or step on them. A lot of leaf litter in there, they can easily spin their cocoon, much higher survivorship. This is where you can do your fancy spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink the lawn. Put a big bed around your trees. Then there's no more grass there. Safe site. This is where you can liberally use your, your uh, ground covers like wild ginger, like may apple, like uh, foam flower, like ferns, um, all, all safe sites. This is a hotel in Athens, Georgia. These are red maple trees. Any caterpillar developing in these trees can drop down in this fern bank and successfully complete its development, even though it's the middle of a city. So we can really uh, boost our, our caterpillar populations and thus our bird food if we landscape properly under our trees. Number five, we, we have to be very careful that, that when we are building these natural landscapes around our, our you know, well, around our homes, that we're not creating ecological traps. And we just talked about one ecological trap, but um, we're gonna call in a lot of birds by producing a lot of bird food. And if we let our cats outside, the cat's gonna eat the birds. We've got cats, feral cats or, or domestic cats killing up to two to 3 billion birds in North America each year. That's, uh, again, that's almost a third of the North American bird population killed by, by outdoor cats. So we know how to control that. We just keep them in, inside. But what about window strikes? You know, we're calling them into our houses and then uh, we're, they hit our windows and they get killed up to 1 billion birds per year killed by, by window strikes. Um, this, is, this is harder to deal with, um, but there are ways. So here's a window at my house. Uh, here's that same window when I put these bungee cords down. I think it's got a name, um, saw it on the web. It works pretty well, folks. I haven't had a, a, a deadly bird strike um, since I've, I've hung these. This is what it looks like when you're looking outside. Um, you know, people say, oh, it's, it's too ugly. But you know, if you kill two birds a year and you've increased nestling success by having native uh, plants in your yard, that's you know, that's zero sum. And as you increase the number of birds in your yard, you're gonna kill more birds. So uh, we've got to pay attention to these ecological traps. Another grad student, Desiree Narango, did some wonderful work with, with uh, chickadees in the uh, suburbs of Washington, DC. And, and she had a lot of results, but one of them suggests there is room for compromise in our plant choice. And that's good news. She had one simple question and that is how do landscapes that are dominated by native plants, how well do they sustain chickadee populations over time compared to landscapes that are, are uh, dominated by introduced plants, typical ornamental plants from someplace else, usually Asia? Uh, well, the first thing she found is that when we're using these ornamental plants, they, they, they produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So you reduce the amount of bird food by 75%. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Every, every yard had a nest box in it, but the birds would come and look around and say, there's not enough food here. We're not even gonna try to reproduce. If they did try to reproduce, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, the nest produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took them 1.5 days longer to, to fledge. And if you put all that together in a population growth model, as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass in your yard, 
from no woody plants, uh, non-native woody plants to 100% non-native. This is what you get. The reason we looked at woody plants is because that's where chickadees forage on woody plants. This dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the, the uh, population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. If you reproduce at that, that rate, you've got a sustainable population. It's, uh, it's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you've got a growing population, anything above the line here, but if you make fewer babies, then uh, adults are dying. Then you've got a shrinking unsustainable population. And that happens when you've got a high percentage of non-native woody plants in your yard. But right here is where those lines overlap. So it suggests you could have a, maybe as high as 30% of your, your woody plant biomass non-native without destroying your local food web. Now, none of these plants, none of those non-natives can be invasive. No calorie pairs, no, no uh, burning bushes. Those are, are ecological tumors. They just keep growing and growing. They, they, they ecologically castrate all the land around you. But things like Persithia, uh, the ginkgo we talked about, they're not invasive. Um, so as long as they're not dominating the, the landscape, you can tolerate a few in your yard. Here's uh, Dan Getman's landscape again. There's a ginkgo tree. I don't know if you picked that up the first time, but that's a ginkgo. Why does he have a ginkgo in this developing native landscape? He has a ginkgo because his wife asked him to put one in. She really likes ginkgos. So, okay, it's there. Is it, is it ruining the landscape, the productivity of this landscape? No, it's not. It's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of the native plants that support those food webs. So put in more native plants and you'll be able to tolerate non-natives as long as they're not invasive. Can we use uh, natives in formal designs? Of course we can. This is a Lynn O'Shaughnessy design. I uh, got it uh, last year, I guess. You don't get more formal than that. This was taken by a drone 400 feet up. Um, every plant in that landscape is, is a native plant. So formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe every day. And I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a pollinator garden into a, a suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can. Put a little fence around it. It formalizes it. It, it tells people that this is an intentional part of the landscape. It's beautiful when it's in bloom. It's not just a patch of weeds that you forgot to, to mow. Um, and it's servicing a number of bees. It's not very big. But if everybody did it, it certainly would help our, our pollinator situations. Why do we need pollinators? You know, the media will tell you it's because they're pollinating a third of our crops. It's actually about a 12th of our, of our crops. But then I hear people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. Forget, forget the crop argument. We all need pollinators, and we need a lot of them because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we would lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet, which is not an option. Where do we need pollinators? Everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere. This is a Drew Latham design, much bigger. Imagine the light of, amount of life that is supported here versus the amount of life that's supported here. Seems like a no-brainer. Can municipalities help us live with, with nature? Yes, they can, and more and more of them are doing it. Minnesota uh, has been doing it for a while. Um, got the Lawn to Legume program. It's a cost-sharing program where the state pays homeowners to, um, or helps pay them to reduce or eliminate their lawn and replace it with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. Very popular program. Pennsylvania has a new lawn conversion program. It's only two years old, but you get up to $5,000 per acre to, to uh, replace your big lawn with, with natives. Uh, there's a, a uh, island off of Florida where the, um, they're paying residents to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. So if you have an endangered species on your property, we're going to pay you to take care of it rather than fine you if you do something with your property. Everybody would want an endangered species. Um, bounties on calorie pair. Missouri, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, Fayetteville, Arkansas, South Carolina has just banned um, calorie pair, I think, and North Carolina's got a bounty on them. You take out a calorie pair, you get a free tree replacement. Even public utilities are getting into the act, giving people $100 coupons, particularly in the West, to plant water efficient uh, plants rather than those thirsty non-natives. And of course, the big lawn conversion programs in California, 
this is, this is going up. It's up to $3 per square foot rebate for every square foot of lawn you get rid of and put in appropriate xeric plants. Um, so if you're interested in, in um, conservation programs that are supported by municipalities, here's a short list of them put together by Ralph Brueggemann. Okay, we have made three missteps, in my opinion, in the early years of conservation. And the first one's important. We've come to think of nature as if it's optional. We like it. Uh, and, and we visit it when, when we can, but we, we don't. Very few of us think it's essential, which means when push comes to shove, when resources are in short supply, nature takes a back seat. The things that are essential will go first. And of course, resources are always in, in short supply. So nature's always taken a back seat. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out. And um, there's this wall size poster there that uh, to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. We wanna save wildlife, save nature for future generations to enjoy. That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for creating the national park system. We wanna make, save these beautiful places so the future generations can enjoy how beautiful they are. Okay, I get that, uh, but that does suggest that nature's just there for entertainment. No wonder we don't think it's essential. It's a little bit more important than that. We need to save nature so that we have future generations, more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now we talked about this, but if we restrict conservation efforts only to places where there aren't a lot of humans, we're gonna fail because those, there's too few of those places. They're too small, they're too isolated. David Quammen has a wonderful analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I, I hate that language because it suggests there are places on planet earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the earth has ecological significance, including our yards, including our, our, our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides, even including much of our, our agriculture. So we've got to glue our rug back together again, folks. We've got to put the plants back, not just to build biological carters that connect those isolated uh, fragments of habitat that still exist, but to create viable habitats where we've destroyed them, where we live, work, farm, play. When we do this, and we're starting to do it, but when we do it, it'll be the first time in modern history that humans have, have coexisted with the natural world. Our third misstep was to, to leave earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, few ecologists. For some reason, we didn't see it as, as uh, an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet. But I don't know why, because everybody on the planet depends entirely on the quality of earth's ecosystem. So why wouldn't everybody be responsible for good earth stewardship? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder once said that the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is I have obligations. You're not born with these mindsets, you're taught them. We're very good at teaching this one. We are terrible at teaching this one to our kids and to our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. That doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. You know, right now the earth has, has huge problems. And, and most people feel absolutely powerless to do anything. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn. One person can turn out their lights. One person can get rid of the invasive plants on their property. One person can use keystone plants. One person can put in a pollinator garden. One person can totally revitalize the little ecosystem right where they live. Uh, and this shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just think about the, the part of the planet that you can influence. If you own property, that's where you start. That's where it's your responsibility to start. If you don't own property, help somebody does. Help a land conservancy, help a park, help a preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power and we all have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. And I think I've convinced my grandkids that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much.
That was inspirational. Thank you. Um, and we do have some questions. So if um, we have a little bit of time, I'll kind of go through some of the questions that we, we got in order or received today, and then we may have a few extra staff. Um, so I'll go ahead and read further. Um, from Steve in South Central Indiana. Um, Steve is saying, we purchased acres of former pasture and woods. They're developing a use plan and doing assessment now. Would like to keep the pasture areas mowed down and we're ready to make changes. When is the best time to mow bush hog? And um, that he's perfect, purposely left it over winter for cover. Um, well, good. That's a good start. You don't want to mow in the fall because that removes all the seeds that support our, our uh, you know, typically our sparrows and our juncos, all those things that come down from the north that do depend on seeds. Um, one thing I might encourage you to do is only mow a third of that pasture land each year so that you have two thirds that go unmowed for, for a year. Uh, because, of course, when you mow the entire thing, there are a lot of things that overwinter in those, those dead stalks. They, you, you think they're dead, but they're, they've got a lot of life in them, and you're destroying all that. Then it's got to be recolonized each year. But if you leave two-thirds unmowed, you can control the woodies by spot treating that come in. I know the woodies are going to want to come in all the time. But each year, or that means any one place in your, your pasture gets mowed once every three years. So it reduces your mowing <clears throat> and you'll have a, a much livelier pasture. And yes, March is the good time to do it, <laughs> if that was the question, right? Thank you, Doug. Um, so we have a question, this question, Rad. Um, he's asking, some non-native plants support many of the same fauna as their native equivalents. Um, I'm particularly interested in whether you have an opinion about European cranberry bush, which I want to hear the answer to. Um, it's on the invasive list for Indiana, and I personally, Mary, sees it everywhere. Um, but I wonder if this is one we go after. Well, you know, we, we compared um, native and non-native congeners, the ones that were in the same genus, uh, to see how well the insects that specialize on one on, on a native in a particular genus, like like a red maple, how well would they use a Norway maple? It's still an acer, you know. Maybe they have all the adaptations to to use it. So we looked at eighteen different congeneric comparisons, and on average, insect use was reduced by sixty eight percent. So so I know you say you know some natives or non natives support life just as well as the natives. Very few, very few. Willow is pretty close to it. Crab apples aren't bad, but very, very few non-natives are as productive as, as natives, and none of them are more productive. So be careful, don't overgeneralize there. You do lose some, and, and that's because the leaf chemistry has changed uh, when, when a plant is isolated, even if it's a close relative when it's, when it's been isolated for a long time. Uh, changes accumulate in the leaves, and then our, our insects don't recognize it and can't get around those defenses. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Ka Karen. Um, I'm wanting to convert my um, three fourths of an acre in downtown to native and pollinator friendly plants. And I think some people helped answer this, um, but Karen's struggling to know where to start as, as what goes where, help. Um, and I think you shared some resources, Doug, about the National Wildlife Federation. Um, Oh, sorry. Do you have any other mm -hmm. suggestions? Sorry. Um, you know, you're, you're really talking about a design issue uh, and there's no one native design. Uh, so it depends on, on a thousand factors and I can't tell you how to do it. I can, I can suggest that um, uh, I never say get rid of your lawn. I say reduce it to the areas where you're going to walk frequently. So figure out where you walk normally and redesign the area that you're going to keep in lawn and then start picking at the areas you're going to take out of lawn. Maybe you're going to add a tree here and a bed under that tree. Maybe you're going to add a pollinator garden over here. Uh, you don't have to do it all at once. Uh, and that, you know, that can get expensive. So just pick at it. But where you put those things, the plants you choose, I mean, those are all design issues that um, a local designer could, could help you with. I don't, I don't know, 
can't give you a name for somebody in your area who's who's actually doing this, but I, it's a growing. Uh, we are starting to fill the niche of ecological landscapers. People are starting to put out their their shingles. So if you know anybody who's actively doing this, advertise them because a lot of people want want this service. You're you're muted again. Muted again. <laughs> I'm sorry. A couple more questions. Um, well, this is, was actually when we were talking about, you know, putting window screens on our, um, our windows to keep bird strikes from happening. Um, Doug, do you have any information about ornamental shining upward into the trees? Is that um, a problem? I don't understand the question. What's going up in the trees? <laughs> oh, ornamental lights shining up oh, versus oh, down. Oh. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Um, ornamental lights. Uh, you know, uh, if it's a a, a white bluish wavelength, um, it does it does attract insects, and that doesn't do them any good. If you can shift that towards yellow wavelengths, that will that will be better. Um, if you can maybe have your ornamental lights on while you're up but then turn them off when you go to bed? Do they really need to be on all night long when everybody's asleep? Probably not. Excellent. Um, and when we're talking the mowing one third of the, the property at a time, um, Art had a question about spring nesting ground birds. Wouldn't it be better to delay mowing until after fledging May into June? Yes. <laughs> Well, that's what, yeah, uh, that's one of the benefits of, of you know, leaving two thirds unmowed. Um, you know, we, uh, we're we losing things like meadowlarks, Eastern meadowlark. I don't know if you guys are, but we sure are in the East and, and um, we've actually got a pair not far from, from where I live right now. Uh, they, had, they had two broods and they were not done until, boy, it was the end of July. So if you can postpone mowing till August, but then you're at the point where, where your golden rods and all these things that are developing to make the seed for the following year are really taking off. Um, that would be the prime time that you don't wanna mow for monarchs. So um, minimizing mowing is, is a really good thing, but you do have to, to mow or burn occasionally to maintain that, that meadow or prairie situation. So, uh, you know, life's, life's a trade-off, um, but yeah, uh, postponing, or the other thing is to, is to mow as early in the spring, maybe even late winter as you can before those ground nesting birds even, even start. That would be another alternative, probably the best alternative. So if you don't have a lot of snow, get, get out there. You're muted. I got to stop that. I'm sorry. I'm just going to deal with the background noise. Uh, another question came from Justin. Uh, Justin saying, my small property is a part of Homegrown National Park and a huge fan. Uh, over 90% of its property inverted um, to straight species of native plants. But I'm wondering about goldenrod native ours. When straight species are hard to find, is it better to use a native ar? Um, and native ar means native cultivar, I'm assuming. Um, or just bypass them all together. And he wants to thank you for your work. And um, her, his wife is complaining that you've created a monster. <laughs> I've heard that before. <laughs> I've, you've ruined my life. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, okay, native ours, you know, are they, are they as, as productive? It depends on what the, the genetic change that created the cultivar actually was. Many of our cultivars are really natural variants that people just found in nature and then put a name on it. And the only problem there is that then they're reproduced clonally so they have no genetic variation. But a lot of the, a lot of cultivars you see are natural variations like the, um, the uh, goldenrod called fireworks. Um, I actually know the guy who who found that he he founded himself. That was a natural variation, and he and he just uh, you know patented it and 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 reproduced it. So cultivars aren't automatically bad. Um, it again, it depends on on the change. If you take a a red leaf or a green leaf and you make it red or purple, that does discourage insect use of the leaves because it introduces lots of of anth anthocyanins to the leaves, which are feeding deterrence. 
Um, if we're fooling with flower structure, that often discourages uh, native bees. And if you make a double flower, it removes the pollen and nectar altogether. So it depends. When you're talking about cultivars of goldenrod, you know, the only culture I know is, is, is fireworks. I'm sure there, there are others, but um, what I would love to do, I, you know, go to your nursery and say, I want to buy a straight species of this, this particular goldenrod. They say, well, we don't have that. I say, can you get it? Well, no. I say, okay, goodbye. They've just lost a sale. And if they hear that enough, they'll start to carry these things. Many of the nursery growers are still convinced that there's not a market for, for straight species. We have to convince them that there is a market that they will sell. These guys just want to sell plants. It's not that they're trying to promote non-native plants. It's just that was all we bought for 100 years. And then we haven't convinced them that we're going to buy the, the natives. So um, try to convince them by not giving them business of buying something else. Excellent. Thank you. Such good advice. <laughs> um, we have a question pop up. Um, and then we'll, we'll be wrapping it up, maybe one or two more. Um, uh, and concerning monarchs um, from Barb, what, would, what reason, um, what would be the reason butterflies go to bone set? Um, Barb's a new citizen science program and is looking into the behavior to find out more about it. Um, I don't know if you have any intel there in addition to that, Doug. I mean, why would they go to bone set flowers? A monarch's never going to eat bone set leaves. <laughs> um, they would go there for the nectar. That's butterflies. You know, we, we talk about saving the monarch because it's a pollinator. It really isn't. Um, most butterflies are not pollinating. They're just getting the nectar. It's the bees that are doing the bulk of our pollination. They're moving the pollen from the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower. But any nectar source uh, for, for butterflies, particularly monarchs when they're migrating, is energy and uh, you know bone set supplies that Joe Pieweed supplies that a lot of things supply that um, particularly those fall esters and those golden rods primary plants for getting getting those monarchs from Canada all the way down to Mexico. Um, question just popped up and then um, we can probably do one more after that. Um, from the ones that I have already. Um, so Sawyer in Brown County, which is just east of here, um, what are your thoughts, Doug, on growing one's own food on, on part of one's own landscape or lawn? Um, and why is it, or why I think conservationists often focus either on growing one's own food or landscaping with native plants, which are inedible to humans for the most part? Where's that balance? Uh, well, that's a good word. It is a balance. Um, and it often comes down to the amount of sun that you have. Growing your food locally is a good thing because you get to control the quality of the food. There's no transportation costs. It's fun. Um, so all of those things are good. When I say we should have native yards, I'm not saying you can't have a vegetable garden. Um, you, we, we need both. Uh, so again, depends on the size of your property, how much sun you have. Um, it's, it's a compromise based on your interests, but there's a lot of pluses associated with growing your own food. Well, since I've been moderating, I'm going to try to sneak in one of my questions. <laughs> um, speaking about um, invasive plants and natives that have an equivalent, um, here in Indiana, we have Asian bittersweet, um, which is rising with our native um, American bittersweet, and then we also have white mulberry, which is native, invasive, which hybridizes red mulberry. In these examples, the species that are native are, are not common, and the invasives are unfortunately incredibly common. If we can't guarantee that those two won't hybridize, do you think it's even realistic to try to preserve these declining species in our home landscapes and in restoration? Well, this is where you have to you have to realize why American bittersweet is not common anymore, and why you have to go to Texas to find true red mul mulberry. It's because of introgression. They do hybridize, and the resulting offspring is almost pure non-native. Um, so that's what's happened with white mulberry over the last three hundred years. the The colonists were were um, encouraged to grow white mulberry because they were going to start a silk moth industry. 
you got a tax break if you planted white white mulberries. Well, that, the silk moth industry didn't didn't work out, uh, but that was the beginning of the end for red red mulberry. Uh, and same thing with the American bittersweet, the the uh, Asian bittersweet hybridizes with it. Uh, we we don't have any here uh, in the Mid Atlantic states anymore. You have to go to Maine to find it. I don't know if you really have. You know, every time somebody says, "Here's American bittersweet," it's not. It's actually Asian. So. Um, the hybridization has happened quickly. Uh, there, there are people in the literature that say, oh, there's no example of, a, of an extinction event by a non-native plant. And all I can say is yet, because those are two primary examples. They're going to wipe them out. And how do you reverse it? I don't think you do. Thank you. Um, we do have questions, but I think we've kind of hit the end of our time frame. So I want to be respectful of everybody's time as well as uh, Dr. Talamese. So, um, John, would you like to, to see us out? Any closing remarks? <laughs> Just want to say thanks so much to uh, everyone for joining us here tonight. Uh, thank you, Doug, so much for being here and um, sharing all your knowledge and uh, inspiration. And I hope that will encourage even more folks to go out there and, and do what they can to, to do likewise. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Good luck to your conservancy. Thank you very much. All right, take Thank care. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks again for, for joining us and uh, plant some natives. <laughs>